Welcome to The Word of the Lord Endures Forever with Pastor Will Whedon. I'll confess to me, the big challenge of all this is just to get out of my own head because I can totally walk right by a crying need and be absolutely oblivious to it. I'm thinking about this or that or the other thing, and so I'm not really seeing what's right there in front of me. In terms of modern jargon, I'm not fully present to the moment unfolding. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a daily verse-by-verse Bible study with the church, past and present. Pastor Whedon is leading us in a study of the book of Psalms, chapters 1 through 41. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Greetings, people loved by God. Today we begin our study of Psalm 41, which is the last psalm in the first book of the Psalter. It will take us two shows, though, to walk through its richness. Remember that last time we finished up Psalm 40, where David insisted that he had told the glad news of righteousness, I called foul on the ESV's rendering deliverance. Jesus, indeed, announces to his congregation the glad news of a complete and perfect righteousness, his achievement in human flesh having lived a perfect and unbroken yes to the will of his heavenly Father. In this, he reveals God's steadfast love and faithfulness to us. He gives us a salvation we could never achieve on our own. Jesus knows as he is preparing to finish this righteousness by his passion and death that his Father's mercy is not going to fail him, but will ever preserve him. He knows this even as evils encompass him beyond number and the entire weight of all human sin is offloaded onto his shoulders. As he bears this burden, he begs for deliverance and help. He prays for the disappointment of Satan and the demons who desire his hope to be put to shame and for his dishonor to be perpetual. But while he prays that they may be disappointed, He thinks of those who will come to rejoice and be glad in the salvation that God is providing through him. How peoples from every nation will join in the shout, Great is the Lord! He is indeed poor and needy, for though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that his poverty might enrich us. And so he begs for a speedy rescue, a rescue that in fact came three days later when his father raised him from the dead. Never! to die again. Moving on then into the 41st Psalm. To the choir master, a Psalm of David. Blessed is the one who considers the poor. In the day of trouble, the Lord delivers him. The Lord protects him and keeps him alive. He is called blessed in the land. You do not give him up to the will of his enemies. The Lord sustains him on his sickbed In his illness, you restore him to full health. As for me, I said, O Lord, be gracious to me. Heal me, for I have sinned against you. My enemies say of me in malice, When will he die and his name perish? Psalm 41, verses 1 through 5. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you came to your own, and they received you not. Grant us your spirit to glorify you in our hearts. Enlighten our souls with this living knowledge that you are the power and wisdom of God, that we may never be offended in you, but may hold your righteousness in an unwavering faith and not be ashamed to confess you before men. For you live and reign with the Father and the same Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Ready to ponder the 41st Psalm together? Let's give it our attention. Verse 1. To the choir master, a psalm of David. Now, instead of to the choir master, the Septuagint bears the superscription for the end. We've encountered that before, and I suggested it might well mean that it was what we'd call a recessional psalm, a psalm to be sung at the end of the temple liturgy. If that is the case, it has about it the flavor of our Lord's admonition in John 13, 17, If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. In other words, an exhortation to put into practice in our lives the very wisdom of God that we've been singing together. That's the same sort of thing we have in the class of hymns we have in our hymnal designated close of the service, 
with a prayer such as this. Thanks we give in adoration for your gospel's joyful sound. May the fruits of your salvation in our hearts and lives abound. Ever faithful, ever faithful to your truth may we be found. But there's a second meaning that end could have, and that is that the hymn sung at the close of the liturgy reminds us of the close of our life and of that final healing God has promised us in the resurrection from the dead. That's also a feature of the hymns that close our services. For example, O grant that each of us now met before thee here may meet together thus when thou and thine appear and follow thee to heaven our home. E'en so amen, Lord Jesus, come. So let's get into the actual going home hymn itself. Verse 1. Blessed is the one who considers the poor in the day of trouble, the Lord delivers him. Let's just note that the psalm proper begins and ends with blessed. We'll get to the final blessed next time. The initial beatitude is spoken over the one who considers the poor. The New Living Translation paraphrases this, Oh, the joys of those who are kind to the poor. So I think we ought to hear considers as in is considerate of the poor. That first of all, requires actually noticing them and not ignoring them. Think of how Dives, the rich man, treated poor Lazarus. He was not considerate of him, basically pretending that he didn't even exist. Now, how does this practically play out? I think I mentioned it before, but I used to work with a fellow named Ralph. He was definitely one of those who considered the poor because he kept brown bags filled with food in his car. And when he drove the streets of St. Louis and its suburbs, if he saw a beggar out, he didn't just cruise on by. He stopped and at least made sure they had a little something to eat. I thought that was so neat. Or my friend Philip. He makes it a point of having small cash in his car, fives and tens, so that if he comes across a person needing help, he always has something to share. Both of those men are examples to me of the blessedness that the psalmist praises here. They're blessed because they are kind to the poor. And such kindness is never for naught. As Proverbs puts it, Proverbs 19, verse 17, whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his deed. This generosity to the poor is the almsgiving, which is praised in the book of Tobit and in the New Testament as something God-pleasing. I'll confess to me, The big challenge of all this is just to get out of my own head because I can totally walk right by a crying need and be absolutely oblivious to it. I'm thinking about this or that or the other thing, and so I'm not really seeing what's right there in front of me. In terms of modern jargon, I'm not fully present to the moment unfolding. This kind of blessedness, then, begins with noticing those in need and then doing whatever we can for them. It may not be much, but whatever it is, the Lord notices and adds a great promise. In the day of trouble, the Lord delivers him. You see this nowhere so clearly unfolded as in Matthew 25, where the Lord says to those who consider the poor, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Now, their good deeds didn't earn them the kingdom, because it was prepared for them before they ever lifted a hand to help the needy. But in the ultimate day of trouble, they found the Lord Jesus himself defending them by pointing to their acts of kindness as signs of their faith in him and so summoning them into his eternal kingdom. Verse 2, The Lord protects him and keeps him alive. He is called blessed in the land. You do not give him up to the will of his enemies. St. Augustine had a fascinating take on this in the 5th century. Check this out. All believers live in Christ's name, and all in their different walks of life fulfill Christ's commandments. So do not say to me, Who is able to keep such a law? He keeps it in me. He who was rich 
but came to the poor. Indeed, came as a poor man to the poor, but as fullness to those who were empty. Anyone who bears all this in mind does not disdain Christ's poverty, but rather understands Christ's riches. Such a person is blessed on the earth and is not delivered into the hands of the enemy who tries to persuade us that we should worship God with an eye to heavenly benefits, but the devil for our earthly needs. Hence, the Lord protects and keeps him alive means the Lord keeps him in the right faith so that he does what's right and blessed and does it all by the power of Christ himself who indwells the believer. And such a one then has zero fear of Christ delivering him over to the devil on the last day to the will of his enemies to separate him from God and from eternal life. And this holds even in the gravest of trials, such as severe sickness and even death. Verse 3, the Lord sustains him on his sickbed. In his illness, you restore him to full health. If you look at your English Standard Version footnote on this, you'll see that the Hebrew more literally says, in his illness, you turn all his bed. St. Augustine again made this observation. Every weakly soul looks for something earthly to rest on in this life, where it can take time off from its efforts and lie down. So the picture is of God upending the soft earthly bed we make for ourselves. He goes on, he overturns all our bedding. We are being taught to love better things by the pain we endure in those things that are inferior. The wayfarer traveling toward his homeland must not fall in love with a stable instead of home. I love that. He mixes just enough misery into this age to make sure that we don't get too comfortable down here and try to settle in. Verse 4. As for me, I said, O Lord, be gracious to me, heal me, for I have sinned against you. So notice again the connection between sin and disease. No, not in the sense that every disease is the result of some specific sin, an idea that Jesus obliterates in John chapter 9. Rather, that sin is a disease in our person. It's something that needs God's healing, his forgiveness, yes, but also healing for the damage which sin always does to us and in us. Verse 5, my enemies say of me in malice, when will he die and his name perish? That's what David's enemies wanted, for him to be dead and forgotten. Well, dead he would be. Forgotten? Never. To this very day, David remains among the most famous of the kings of the earth because from his loins, God brought forth the king who would indeed be gracious to us and heal all our diseases, the king of the Jews who would die on a cross, be raised in glory, ascend to the throne of heaven, rule over all things, and who will finally return in great glory to raise David and all the dead and bring them into his father's home safe forever from the malice of those evil spirits who would accuse and condemn. Right there is where we're going to have to call our hiatus for today. Next, we'll finish up Psalm 41, and that will be it for the Psalter for a while as we turn back to the New Testament. Till next time, people loved by God, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thanks for listening to The Word of the Lord Endures Forever with Pastor Will Whedon. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a listener-supported program. You can donate by check. Make your check payable to The Word Endures and send it to Box 616, Collinsville, Illinois, 62234. You can also make a secure online contribution at thewordendures.org. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a production of LPR, Lutheran Public Radio.